Hi everyone, it's Nancy at Sipping and Painting Hamden again, and I'm going to show you how to paint this lovely painting of a forest scene. It's very abstract and, uh, or maybe that's impressionistic. If there's a continuum from realistic to abstract, this is somewhere in the middle, uh, so I guess that's more impressionistic. And it's very bright and colorful and it just reminds me of a walk in a forest on a beautiful sunny day. And so that's what we're gonna do today. All right, I'm using a 16 by 20 canvas and uh, it's pre-gesso. This is just the kind that you get at Michael's. Nothing fancy. Uh, we don't do anything fancy around here. We just, we just have fun painting. I also have a large flat, a medium flat, and a small round brush. You can use three sizes of any brush you want. Uh, I will show you how to do it and you can adjust depending on what materials you have handy. <clears throat> As always, we also are using our three primary colors because I'm going to show you how to mix paint if you need other colors and our black and our white. Um, if you have those five colors, you can paint anything under the sun. Uh, so yeah, let's get going. All right, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put my brush, my big brush, in the water and I'm going to just coat my canvas with a little bit of water. Now if you live in a humid place and your canvas is already humid, you might not need to do this, but I do it because I do it because uh, Denver's really dry where we live. And so it just helps my paint move around more easily. Okay, uh, this is my water jar. I always have water with acrylic paint because acrylic paint is water soluble. It dries very quickly in about 10 minutes. So I always put my brush back in the water uh, when I'm finished with a step. Uh, instead of doing that, what we just did, you could also use a spray bottle. I just got this at the dollar store. You can see how absolutely filthy it is because we've used it 10 million times. But uh, you could also just spray it. And that's real quick too. That's much faster. So either way, whatever works for you. Now don't get your water jar mixed up with your beverage. It's daytime, so I'm gonna be uh, drinking water, but maybe you have a glass of wine while you paint. That's what I like to do uh, in the evening. So cheers to you. All right, so I'm gonna start with the background. That's what I almost always do in my paintings. Now my yellow paint is pretty, it's pretty tough to get yellow to show up. So I'm gonna take a little bit of white and I'm gonna mix that in with my yellow. The reason I wanna do that is not because uh, I don't want the paint to be lighter necessarily. I just, not a lot of yellow, but I do want it to be, have more body to it, more pigment. And white uh, will give it a little more body. Now this yellow in the painting is a little deeper and warmer. And what I mean by warmer, is it has a little bit of red in it. So I'm gonna take my brush and I'm just gonna pick up a little bit of that red, just a little bit, just a tiny bit, not too much. And I'm gonna stir it into my yellow. So this is probably, if you had divided your yellow up into 20 parts, this is about one part red. It's just a tiny bit. It's like a quarter of a ladybug. And it's just gonna give me a slightly richer, more orangey, yellow, hopefully, if I did it right. All right, so I'm still stirring that around, still stirring that around. I probably should have mixed my green first before doing that with my yellow, but ruh -ruh, you know, it's okay. All right, so I maybe use a little bit too much red, but I'm gonna live with it, because paint's in the back of the room and I'm not. So, that's okay, it's still yellow enough. All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, just, uh, I'm gonna streak on some yellow areas on this, on this painting. And you can see that my yellow does have a little bit of, it is a little orangey, but that's all right. It's a pretty orange, warm painting, so it's not perfect, that's okay. My philosophy is perfection is the enemy of art. Notice I'm just using my big brush and I'm doing nice big brush strokes. I'm going to start down in the corner in some areas, and I'm going back and forth at an angle when I'm doing this. And the reason for that is I can just kind of picture the sun coming in 
at an angle in this painting. So I'm liking that. If you don't like that, you do you. It's your painting, your world. You do it the way you want. It's not a completely yellow underpainting. It does have a lot of yellow under, um, underpaint in there. What I mean by underpaint is the first layer. But it's not completely yellow. It's not completely yellow. All right, nice. And let's see, anywhere else I want to stick it? Maybe a little bit down here. I'm just looking to see where I see a little bit of yellow shining through. Definitely up here. And I'm just looking at this painting as a reference and copying where I see a little yellow. Lots of yellow here, lots of yellow here, lots of yellow here, some down here, a little down there. Yeah. I'm pretty happy with that. I hope you are too. All right, and now the next color I'm gonna use because they're related is I'm gonna make an orange. And so I'm gonna pick up some more of my red paint, orange and yellow, I mean, pardon me, red and yellow make orange. So I'm only gonna do that on one side of this yellow. I don't wanna use up all my yellow because I'm gonna to have to make some green too. Uh, so I'm gonna need that yellow. So I'm just using one side of my yellow to mix in with that red. Now, remember when I was telling you that yellow is kind of a wimpy pigment, so it's, it, I have a lot of red on my brush, and that yellow is just barely showing up, barely showing up. I might have to go get some more yellow if I end up mixing all this yellow in. So it just depends on what paints you have laying around. You know, when we do these videos, they're beginning videos for beginning painters, and we realize that you're probably gonna use the paints you have laying around and not necessarily an exact kind that we recommend. So that's why we don't. Um, and but if we get a lot of YouTube likes, well, maybe someday we will, uh, because then the, we'll, need, we'll get sponsors. <laughs> That'd be fun. All right, anyway, so I've got my, um, I've got my orange created. You can see that's now orange, okay? And it's still got a little bit of, red on my brush, and I'm not really gonna worry about that because I, I actually like having my paints not mixed perfectly when I'm doing a landscape. I like things to uh, look a little more organic and not perfect. So I'm gonna start streaking in some orange, some orange, wherever I want, basically, and I'm just kind of, sort of, kind of, sort of copying the areas that where it's on this painting. And notice I'm using my large brush and I'm just streaking it back and forth and I'm doing the generally general same areas that's on this painting. But you know, I never, when I'm painting, I never worry about anything being matchy matchy, like perfect. And the reason for that is when you're painting, your personality is gonna come through your painting. No matter how much you fight it, it's gonna happen and that's actually beautiful. That's a great thing. You want your personality to come shining through in your painting. All right, so I'm gonna keep putting some more orange on. I see some over here. And then notice how I'm not being perfect. I'm not necessarily always going back and forth at a diagonal. Sometimes I'm going up and down a little bit. You do whatever makes you feel good. Okay, but the general idea is I'm putting these colors on in splotches and sometimes they're going to overlap with each other. Um, but still, we're, we're early on in the painting, so mostly it's not going to do that. Um, but if it does, embrace it and go with that because that's great. Okay, a little bit of orange up there. Yeah, maybe a little orange there. There's lots of orange up here. And so I'm just kind of sort of going in the same general areas that the original painting had um, orange, but I'm not being fussy about it at all. Let's see, hold on one sec. Running out of orange, so I'm mixing up a bit more. Okay, um, seems like there was more in here. I don't know, maybe some down here, maybe. But like I said, don't worry about it. All right, now my brush, I, I brushed my, I used my brush until it's almost dry. 
I'm gonna wash it off real good. Next, I'm gonna be making green, and I wanna be sure that when I make green, that my uh, orange isn't in there, because uh, I'm not ready to have brown yet. So I have, I'm taking a little bit of blue, and I'm going to scoop it into a little bit of yellow, and I'm gonna stir them. So when they're next to each other on the plate like that, it makes it easy, because I can just pull a little from one side and pull a little from another, and that's a really lazy, easy way to paint. Now, if you the bluer you have it, the more of a phthalo green color you'll have. And what I mean by that is cooler. Um, blue is a cool color, and the more blue you have in it, the cooler your blue. The more yellow you have in it, the warmer or the more spring-like your painting will be. So you decide how spring-like you want it. You want more yellow or more blue? You decide. So I'm picking up that green on my brush, and now I'm going to look at where on the painting did the original artist put green? And see, when I'm turning my brush like that, I'm getting smaller areas. You can see, let me just show you in a stripe. So let's say, let's do it up here. I have a skinny area of green, but if I turn my brush in the other direction, I get more green in a flat, fatter area. So you decide, do you want flat strokes or do you want thin strokes? It's really, Thin like a knife, flat like that, flat like a brush. You decide what kind of strokes you want. This is your painting and you do it your way. It's really, there are few places in life where you can do things your way. Um, painting is one of them. Bob Ross always used to say that it's your world. You create your world the way you want it to look. And there's lots of brown down, lots of green down here. There's a lot of brown in there. We're gonna have to make some brown up down there because there's shadows at the bottom of this forest. And so they're represented by the color brown around in here. So we'll have to go back in and put in some brown, but for now I'm just gonna put this layer of green and let's see a little bit. Where do I see green? Um, there's more green, let's see, right in the yellow. And notice how I'm not being fussy. One thing that you can also do, and I probably should have told you this earlier, but I'll just tell you now. You can also paint the tops and sides and bottom of your canvas. When you do that, so as you're going with these colors, you can just paint the tops and sides and bottoms. When you do that, you create an automatic frame for your painting. It's called a gallery wrap. And that's kind of cool because then you don't have to pay a lot of money for a frame. You just uh, hang it on the wall and it's, uh, it's a more modern kind of upbeat, well, not upbeat, but it's more modern look for sure. Okay, so uh, there's also some blue in here, I just noticed. My brush is pretty clean because I've just been using the same paint over and over. So you can either wash your brush like that and then dab it on the napkin, that's what I always do, or you can just go right into the next color if your brush is dry, if you want them to mix more. Some people don't like things mixing. I love mixing paint on my brush. But if you're a fussy person in your life, like if you have a, if you're an accountant or an engineer, or maybe you have a job where you have to be very detailed, you probably are gonna be more likely to clean your brush and wanna have specific colors um, and not experiment with painting all the different colors on your brush without cleaning your brush. That's kind of a, just it's just really a, a, your style, however you wanna do your style. You, you decide, this is your painting, your world, you decide. Do you wanna mix colors in your brush and be happy with what you get and not fuss about it? Or do you wanna have them clear and distinct and know exactly what you're putting down when? It's your painting, you decide. Now while the paint, I didn't pick up any more, you notice, while the paint is still kind of wet in some spots, I'm going to take my brush and I'm going to lightly flick those areas. And what that's doing, now my brush is dry and the paint is mostly dry too, but by lightly flicking those areas and blending them, and I don't want this totally blended, <coughs> excuse me, I don't want this totally blended obviously because uh, I want those distinct colors. But while my, my paint is 
a little bit wet still. I would say it's 60 to 70 percent dry. If I do that, then I'm going to get blends of different colors. Uh, and I know that my paint is still a little bit wet because in some areas I, it's shiny. There's two ways to know if your paint is still wet. One is to hold it at an angle. You can see the shininess in some spots on there. If I, depending on how I move it, there's some shiny areas. That means it's still wet. But another way is to pick it up and wipe it on the person next to you. And I guarantee that that will be an effective way to know, but you won't have any friends. That person will probably not like you anymore. So I would go with the shiny way. If you want to keep your friends and family, go with the shiny way. So right now I'm just lightly touching this canvas, lightly touching it. And I, I would say it's probably about 10% wet and 90% dry. And so this is called the dry brush technique. And what it means is I don't have any paint on my brush anymore. It's dry. And my paint on my canvas is almost entirely dry. But there's just enough on there that I can blend it a little bit so I don't have distinct blocks of color. Now, maybe you like distinct blocks of color, and that's exactly what you want to keep. See, at this point, my brush is so dry and the paint is so dry, I'm not doing anything really here by doing this. Um, but I want, I want it to be muted and mixed in a little bit, so that's why this is working pretty well for me. But again, you, you do it exactly the way you want to do it. All right, now my dry, my brush is dry, as I said. I can put it in water, get some more water on it, dab it off so I don't have any big drips. And if there's any areas that I see that really need to be blended, if I still do it while my paint is 95% dry, I can still maybe possibly move a little bit of that paint. All right, so I'm pretty happy with what I have so far. Now there's some lighter, brighter areas of yellow. So if I really wanted to, I could go back in and I could just touch up anything that I want, just a smidge brighter. I could do that um, where it's not so blended in, but not do it in every spot. But if I just wanted some clear areas to say, wow, this is where the sun is really peeking through. It's really vibrant and just these little specific areas, uh, then I can do that. And you could do that with any color, but yellow is really the one that shows up in this painting as being really vibrant. And uh, just like streaks of light darting through the leaves of your forest. That's, that's what I see. And by going at this angle, it just saying, oh, there's just streaks of light just coming right through the leaves. All right. Now, if I didn't, hadn't mixed a tiny bit of white into that yellow, I probably wouldn't be able to do this because yellow is a pretty translucent color. What I mean by that is it's not opaque. It's not solid enough on its own. And that's why adding a tiny bit of white really helped give it a little body and sticks to the canvas more better. Um, blue does that really well on its own. Red, does, uh, red also can use a drop of wait sometimes. All right, well I could play with this all day, but um, I do want to show you how to make brown. Now this is my way of making brown. Probably art school people would not be thrilled with this, but I'm going to tell you my little cheat way, okay? If you think uh, a primary color and then a secondary together, but that's too hard to remember if you're not an art person. So I think of it as Christmas brown. I take a little bit of red, I pop it up, on, I take a little bit of green, red and green. And the reason they make brown is because they're opposites on the color wheel. They look great together for that reason. They complement each other. That's why roses are so beautiful. Red and green together. Because green is made of yellow and blue. Red is red. They're the three primary colors, yellow, blue, and green. And when you mix your three primary colors together, you can create brown. Depending on the exact shade of those colors or value, you might get 
you know, darker charcoal, or you might get um, gray, but depending on exactly what you're, how much of each you're mixing, in my case, I definitely got brown. Definitely got brown. One time I was taking a class with this guy down in Florida, and uh, he was showing me that if you mix orange and blue, like really deep value orange and blue, you can make a black. And boy, that just blew me away. All right, so there's a little bit of brown in there. That's, um, this brown is lower in the canvas, so that's like the shadow area. That's where the sun can't really reach those bottom plants down near the forest floor. So that's why I am focusing more brown of that brown down below. Okay, still in those same streaky patterns, more or less. And I can just scribble it in any place that I need to just to darken it up a smidge. I could even mix it with something, but all right. I like the vibrancy of this painting, so I'm not going to overdo the brown. All right. So my painting is almost entirely dry, and so is my brush. So I'm just going to go ahead to the next level, the next step. But if you're watching me and you need time for yours to dry, then just turn off the video. Just put it on pause. Go get your beverage, use the restroom, answer the door, whatever you need to do. Take the dog out. And then come on back. And by then, your painting will be dry too, your background. But I'm just going to go full steam ahead. You ready? Okay. So I'm going to make a big trunk here. I'm going to make a trunk there. And I'm going to make a trunk there. And I'm going to use my brown. Now I'm probably going to have to mix some more brown because I didn't mix enough. So let me just start. I'm just going to start with my brown. And then I'm going to mix some more. Remember how we made brown? I took green. And red. And I don't have any green made, so I'm just going to have to mix my own with a little yellow, a little blue, and a little red, and mix them all together. Notice when I mix paints, I don't take all of the paint from that pile because I'm going to be I'm, I'm using those primary colors to mix different colors, so I never take all of it, or I don't put my brush right down in the middle because then I have to go get more paint. I'm um, kind of frugal that way and kind of lazy that way. So I use the side of my palette or paper plate or whatever you have to mix that color without, without ruining the middle of all of my colors. Okay, so now I have this, oh my goodness, that's a dark, deep, dark, rich brown, which will do, that'll be fine. All right, and I'm going to do a big, now this brown might be a little cooler, meaning like more black than the um, original, but that's okay. We're gonna put other colors on it and lighten it up. So there's my first one. And this trunk is crooked because in the woods, in the forest, if you go hiking, you'll notice that trunks are seldom standing up straight. Now this one I'm gonna do at an angle, but notice how I turn the brush to the side. And that gives me a thinner tree. And push all the way down, or if you can come up from the bottom and push Go lighter as you go so that the base of your tree is wider at the bottom and then lighter at the top. That makes it thinner. I'm gonna do a third trunk over here. Now this one's fat, this one's thin, and this one's medium, like the three bears. But if you put yours in different angles or yours are different sizes, that works too, that's just fine. All right, the bit, the underpainting, the bottom base is just a brown tree. Easy, now we're gonna let that dry a bit and I'm gonna put my brush in the water and now I'm gonna go put my baby brush in the water. I'm gonna get it moist, wet, all right. And now I'm gonna use just my black paint to put on a whole bunch of twigs on that, those trees. So here's my black paint. I'm gonna put the paintbrush in the black paint and I'm gonna twist and turn, twist and turn on the side of my plate like that, and that chisels it. And then what I wanna do is I wanna come up along the side of my tree, and then I'm gonna twist and turn, and I'm going, I'm literally twisting and turning my brush as I do that, 
And the reason for that, I'm gonna come up along the side here and do the same thing. The reason why I'm twisting and turning as I go is I don't want anything to be straight. Nature doesn't really have straight lines. Branches are curvy and twisty and bark is bumpy and trees are gnarly. If you don't believe me, go look at Van Gogh's, um, is it Van Gogh? Uh, sorry. Look at all the, the painting called Almond Branches. Wow, that is super gnarly. And it's a beautiful painting. It's flowers, but it's, you know, buds, but super gnarly. And you don't even notice how gnarly it is unless you're painting it. All right, so I'm going along the sides and I'm just create, I'm twisting and turning to create those branches. I'm just using the side as kind of a base to start on. These branches were um, outlined. And so might as well just use the sides of it to give me a running start on these branches. I mean, I meant to say that the trunks were outlined. Um, I don't want a perfect outline on any of them. I just want some parts of it. So I'll start in the middle. All right, so notice how I'm getting these branches. Now these are even more twisty, turny, and gnarly. Some of them even go down. Um, this person painted very loose. This was a very loose painter who was really comfortable with things not looking perfect, which is great because nature is never perfect. If you find a straight line in nature, send it to me. My email is handinsippinpaint at gmail.com. If you find a straight line in nature, send it to me, will you? They do exist. Sometimes on shells, they have, you know, they have like geometric patterns. Um, and that's fun to paint. But usually when it comes to trees and branches and flowers, they're usually anything but straight. They're usually kind of gnarly. And I'm having a good time painting gnarly. I'm just going, starting on the side and I'm twisting and turning. And the more gnarly, the more fun it is to paint. I don't even know what that is. All right. Twisty, turny, gnarly branches. All right, I could do that all day, that's kind of fun. Let me not overdo it though. This one, kind of growing down like that. And let's see. Ooh, do I see any more that are growing down? One up here maybe. You know, mine doesn't match that one exactly by any stretch, but I am so fine with that because this is not supposed to be perfection. This is supposed to be your impression of a forest, your impression. And uh, when Monet painted Impressionism, he people were, I guess, they just couldn't believe that anyone would mess paint something so messy and imperfect. And he said, you know, my style of painting, and what he meant by that was Impressionism, it got a name later. He said, my style of painting is if you look at something and then you look away, what you remember is what I paint. Boy, he was a radical in his day. People didn't know what he was talking about, but you know what, it's lasted so long. And if you ever have an opportunity to go to France and go to Monet's Gardens at Giovanni, oh my gosh. Breathtaking, breathtaking. All right, so I have to let this dry. I don't have a choice. I don't have a choice to let that dry. Uh, um, and so we can concentrate on other things while we let that dry, okay? So I put my brush in the water. And then what I'm gonna do now, I'm not gonna mess with any of that black. I'm gonna leave it alone. But there's something else I can do while I'm waiting. So I'm gonna wash my brush really good. Wash my brush super good. Now I wanna go in, and remember that green we made, we used a little bit of yellow. We used a little bit of blue. So I'm gonna do that again. Big clean brush, yellow. And then some of my blue, I'm gonna swirl it around. And that's gonna give me green again. Okay. 
I've got some green now. It's just yellow and blue. And now I'm going to go into my white and I'm going to pick up some white. And I'm going to mix that in too. And what it's going to give me is a lighter shade of green. And it's going to be a minty green, a cool green, which is more like, you know, winter green or um, in, in the paint world, phthalo green is a blue green. It's a, warm, a cool green. Um, but this is more like a teal. That's what I'm going for. All right, so on this painting, and you don't have to mix it perfectly. In fact, perfect is better, imperfect. Do you see these teal leaves? There's some teal leaves. So I'm going to go ahead and just use the full thickness of my big brush. And notice how I didn't mix it perfectly. That's fine. I, I like it that way. And I'm going to put leaves, but I'm going to make sure I put them in different directions. And if you want to pick up a little bit of white on some of them and and just dab a tiny bit of white on, on them, or just don't blend your blue perfectly, it'll show up even better. So if I just uh, stick a little bit of white in my teal and then don't mix it, just leave it kind of blotchy, like a wintergreen candy, then it's gonna show up even better. It's got a little white on there. Okay, so I'm, notice how some are going in some direction, some in the others. I can lift them from the base like that, or I can come down. It really doesn't matter, but just put them in the spots where you're not going to hit your black. We want to let that black dry and not mess it up. And th again, this is the, it's not the knife point like that. It's the sharper side like that. And make sure you have, you know, a few here and there in every section and go in between the black. I can't, you don't want to mess up your black because that'll come back and make a mess. All right. Now we could have put the black on after the green. That would have worked too. When you're painting, there's lots of different ways to get to the same place. And my uh, employees sometimes will ask me, how, how exactly do you want me to paint this? Do you want me to do this part first or do you want to do it that way? And I always tell them, you know, you're the artist, you decide. Just make it at the end, make it look like what we talked about it looking like. And uh, it's amazing that, you know, you could have five artists and they could, they might paint their painting a different way than four other artists. Um, and that's, boy, that's what I just love about this. It's, it's so fun to see people's personalities come out in their painting. So put as many of those as you want. And I'm gonna clean my brush. If you want, and that this one I'm tell you is not in this step, but if you want any leaves in different colors, like let's say I wanted to pick up some yellow and put a few of those in there, you can do that. No one's gonna stop you. It's your world, it's your painting. You decide. If you you know need to brighten yours up a little bit because it got a little dark with the brown or the black, uh, or you went crazy with the branches and you just want anything to be something to be a little lighter, you can do that. Um, we have a few different copies of this painting in the, in the studio and uh, one day I was bored and I just put some yellow dots on one of them, yellow leaves. Um, and I just, you know, it just brightened it up a bit. And it was kind of funny, it was actually because I wanted to brighten up the corner where the painting was hanging. Um, but it's your call. You don't have to do that. You can, uh, you can paint on any color leaves you want but I'm just letting that black just dry. I just want that to dry um, because it's, um, yeah, because that black would really be a mess if it were um, mixed up. Okay, so I can still see that some areas are shiny. Now there's a couple different ways to dry your painting, we have a um, fan in our studio and sometimes I'll put the uh, paintings in front of a fan if I'm in a hurry to get done. Now paint, acrylic paint dries really fast, it's silly. Like in 10 minutes it's dry, but sometimes you don't have 10 minutes. So if you wanna paint a little faster, all you have to do, you can put a blow dryer on it, you can put a fan on it, or you could do this. This is my favorite way because I like to dance and I'll be like, hoo hoo, you know, I'll be singing a song and I'll dance around the room, and it's just kind of fun to do it this way. Um, and when I'm teaching at class, it's a lot more fun 
to have a bunch of people doing this than standing in the line waiting for a blow dryer or putting their painting in front of the fan. So this is kind of fun. We'll play music and dance around. And uh, I much prefer this way. It's free, it's cheap, it doesn't take any electricity whatsoever, and it gets your adrenaline going, and it's just plain fun. All right, so my black is still pretty wet, but there's some things that I can do even though it's wet. Now remember, this is an, uh, a pretty loose painting, and it's got this impressionistic highlights and shadows that if you really look at them, they don't make sense up close, but they are gonna make sense when, uh, when we step back 15 feet, and that's how you view impressionistic paintings. So I took my baby brush and I went into that winter green color that I had, and now I'm gonna to start to streak it in areas on this tree. And this particular artist wasn't even too concerned about highlight side and shadow side of a tree, not at all. This particular artist, I think, was probably thinking that light is bouncing around and dancing all over in the forest. And sometimes it reflects on the right side of the tree and sometimes it reflects on the left side of the tree and sometimes it reflects near the bottom and sometimes at the top. And this particular artist wasn't even remotely concerned about exactly where they were putting it. Mostly, I'd say on the left is where this, these colors tend to be, um, but it's pretty loose, pretty loose, much looser than I'm doing right now. So I can mix it up, mess it up a little bit by just going quickly, streaking it a bit without being careful at all what's happening. That makes a, if I choke, if I choke up on the pencil, on the pencil, sorry, on the brush like this, I get really tight um, control, but if I want to make things looser, I pull back on the brush, and then I, when I flick it, it's gonna give me a more loose uh, look. All right, so I've got that on there. I'm gonna clean my brush. The other color that they put in there is lavender, which is, this is an interesting painting. All right, so I'm gonna take a little of my blue on my baby brush, Take a little of my red on my baby brush, and then a big scoop of white. I'm gonna mix them up, see what I got. I'm gonna go, I'm going for something that kind of sort of looks like lavender. Kind of sort of, let's see what I get. Blue is powerful. Blue, blue paint is a powerful, um, for the most part, like a lot of it has blue, a uh, phthalo blue in it, and phthalo is a really powerful pigment. And so if you are mixing blue with anything, well, if you're mixing blue and red together, you're probably gonna use a lot more red than you are blue to get the color you want because the blue is powerful and the red is wimpy. So just kind of keep that in mind. There are different kinds of blues, different kinds of reds. And so it just really depends on the exact kind that you have, but by and large, more red than blue will give you a purple you can live with. I'm gonna use a little more white. Swirling it in. And in fact, if I don't swirl it too much and leave it a little bit marbly, that's even cooler. That's cooler. All right. So I have this, it's not, it's kind of this, these particular paints that I used, they're not really making it purple so much as a gray, which I'm finding kind of interesting. But you know, play with it until you get a shade that you like. And then don't worry about it. Because two paintings don't have to look exactly the same. All right, and like I said, if, if you have some white in there that's not perfectly mixed in, all the better. That's even better. If it's marbly, that's good. Now, there's highlights kind of along this side, and I'm holding far back on my brush so I can be loose. Now this is where those, those accountants and People in finance and engineers, ooh, this is hard for them because they don't like to be loose with their painting or with anything really, <laughs> with their money. Uh, but for this painting, you need to be kind of loose. So now I might even go outside the lines a bit. You see that? I went outside the line to make the tree a little bit wider. 
Ooh, who would have thought? And again, I'm, I'm pulling way back on this. When I'm touching, I'm pulling way back because I want it to be nice and loose, loosey-goosey. And I'm just kind of flicking it on from, I'm holding it at the, at the back of the brush and I'm just kind of flicking it on. Now, do you see how that creates the, the it gives the trunks these light, these, there's light and shadow just kind of all playing together. And there is some white in there too. So I just picked up pure white and then I'm going to flick it so softly, so softly that you barely even know it's there. So softly in just a little bit of these areas. I am barely touching that brush, barely touching it. That reminds me, at Sipping and Painting Hamden, sometimes we teach Bob Ross classes, and you now we teach 90% acrylic classes, but every so often I teach Bob Ross class, I would say about 10% of the time, Bob Ross, and those are oil classes, and I'm gonna be doing some of those soon. I'm gonna have to charge for those, admission to those, um, because uh, it was a fair amount of work getting my certification and uh, but man it's fun painting Bob Ross is fun and he used to say when he would touch light lands like he would say two hairs and some air all right so I've got color in my trunks and I've got the black and white limbs but I need to put some black and white squiggles through my trunks and have some of those limbs cross over so I just have my baby brush I put it in the black and I um, chiseled it on the side of my plate and then, then here, okay, this is how loose this painter was. They just put some random lines in there in the painting, just random lines. Some are like straight across and or slightly curved, suggesting a curve on the tree. Some of them are like that. And then some of them are just look like squiggles. They kind of remind me of hieroglyphics or something. Uh, and it's just, you know, this is where that the shadows and the bouncing off the scars in the tree. And by having these scars in the tree, it kind of suggests that these are aspens or birch because those kind of trees have white trunks. Now this is nowhere near a white trunk, but they do have lots of scars in the tree, lots of scars. And so by putting those random black lines in there, and, and if you if your tree lost its shape, you can put a girdle on it. What I mean, I'm just getting is a little more outline. If you lost your shape, if you rid of the colors, that's fine. All right. So more of these scars, 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 scars. And they, some of our wiggles, some of them are straight lines going horizontally. Lots of zigzags. You might want to put a circle. Maybe there's some of those in there too. Maybe there's some scars that look like little circles, like where maybe a bear tried to climb this little tree and the tree went, no, can't support you, and a branch broke off. Who knows? Just put on whatever little random lines and scars in there that you want. Yeah, like that. And I'm looking, I like to step back from my painting. I'm gonna step back, see it from a few feet away. You can still hear me, I'm just stepping back behind my easel and I'm pretty much liking my painting pretty much be sure that you move about 15 feet away that's really important look at your painting from 15 feet away I promise you it won't look the same as it did up close all right so here's where you just tweak if you need to tweak if you need any little uh Things going in another direction, you can do that. Um, when I stepped away, I thought, yeah, the original has has branches going in all different directions um, and is quite a bit messier uh, in a good way. So like in here, make sure any branches that you have coming off of your trunks, that they are thinnest, thickest at the base of your branch coming off the trunk. So it's kind of like a shoulder on your arm because they don't just grow thinly from the trunk they grow thickly from the trunk and they get thinner as they go out so if you see any branches that really don't look like they're connected to the tree you can give it a little bit of a shoulder i call it a shoulder i don't know what it is just thicker at the at the 
tree trunk and thinner as it goes out. And that looks a little bit more realistic. You can really see that here. This one's very thick here. And uh, that just helps kind of cement that branch onto the tree so it won't break off so easily when your eight-year-old tries to climb that little tree or a bear or whoever. And that one has some kind of something on it. I don't know if those leaves or what they are. Uh, yeah. I like to make sure that my branches are widest at where they touch the tree trunk. Widest where they touch the tree trunk. So that's, you know, free tip on how to paint a tree. Make sure your branches are attached through wider at the trunk. All right, so I could fuss with this all day and I'm not going to, I'm gonna call it done. I'm happy with this painting. It's not exactly like the, like the original, that's okay. My, my yellow is a little more muted, muted. I probably put in a little bit too much orange, you know, red, a little bit too much white, and I made my yellow a little more muted, but I'm actually totally happy with that. Um, I never want my painting to look exactly like the original because I'm not like the other artists, right? And neither are you. All right, one thing I could do if I wanted, last thing, if I want to mix a little bit more red into that brown that I made before, a little more red and a little more yellow, I could warm up my brown, okay? And if you have a lot of blue in it, you'll get more of a charcoal than a brown. And so I noticed that mine, my brown was more of that charcoal-y brown. It must've had more blue in it. So if I want a warmer brown, all I have to do is put more yellow and more red in it. And then I get a warmer uh, milk chocolatey brown as opposed to a dark, cool, um, dark chocolate brown, right? Okay, so the only thing that, I, that I'm really noticing about this painting when I look at it and how it's different is that there is some brown brown in, in that painting, in that trunk too. Do you see that? There's some brown brown. And what I mean by brown brown is it's a little bit of a warmer brown. So if I want to, uh, just because I have time and why not? It's my painting. I can do whatever I want, right? Yours, you can do whatever you want. If you want to streak in any brown brown, you just go ahead. But you know what? You don't have to. And maybe your painting looks better if you don't fuss with it. My philosophy is if you like it 80%, walk away. Walk away. And I'm pretty close to that point now when I do my Bob Ross painting, paintings. Oh my goodness, I have been so happy with one of my paintings and then thought, oh, I'll just touch this one little bit up and then boom, then I hit it. And uh, so what I've learned is sometimes you just have to walk away. And uh, yeah, so I'm pretty close to doing that right now. This tree is a little thin at the base. I just put a little more brown down there to pull it up. And I'm thinking that maybe I need to stop. Sometimes I have to ask my staff, tell me to stop painting. And then, uh, and I, with my students in this class, sometimes I have to go step away from your painting. Uh, and then they laugh. So anyway, I think we're done. I'm gonna call it done. Now I'm gonna take my baby brush and I'm gonna put it into whatever color I want. My painting, my world, who cares? I'm gonna use red because it stands out really nice. And boop, there's my initials. Boop, boop, right in the lower right-hand corner. And I'm done. So that's my painting, Forest Glow. And I would love to see your copy of this painting, your uh, impression of this painting, rather. Um, so if you paint it, get a picture. And I think, yeah, I'm pretty sure. I, I think on YouTube, you can actually uh, post a photo in comments. I hope so. Um, if not, and you have a website, send me a link in the comments and let me know. Please like and subscribe to our channel. Uh, we are an independent family owned studio in Southeast Denver. And uh, we hire all local artists to do everything here from bartending to creating new art, to waiting tables, to uh, uh, teaching and cleaning. Um, website everything and we so that way we keep local artists employed which is really a huge important value for us 
Um, so you can help me spread the word about our, uh, our classes that are on YouTube for free uh, by liking and subscribing and tell your friends. They can come and paint and sip with you anytime. You can also host a paint party at home and then have people from other states or countries join you um, because YouTube is everywhere. Anyway, that's it for me. Thank you so much. And I really appreciate you joining me today and uh, happy painting. Look forward to painting with you soon. Bye-bye.